Hello. Uh, give a quick background, just I guess to give some context to what we do or what you know where we come from. So my background: um, worked restaurants through high school. Um, then I moved into uh, uh, technology. I kind of wanted to pick a trade, and I went to electronics. And then I ended up getting into telecom. So I did telecom for the first three years um, of my working kind of adult life. And then 9/11 hit. Joined the military. Did three years or four years there, ballistic missile defense and anti-submarine warfare. So I did a lot of tech, computer stuff, and then I kind of fell into love with wine. And then I became a sommelier. So went through that, used my GI Bill to go to culinary school. And then from there, I've managed businesses and F&B director and GM of a bunch of different uh, opening restaurants. And then over the last five years, been more in the operations and consulting side of things. And now I work with uh, my business partner, Jennifer, in, uh, what do we do? Marketing. So I, uh, I run operations for that company, but along the way, when we have different clients that do um, operation or uh, what's it called marketing needs from us, I step in and I help with HR, operations, uh, payroll, all kinds of things in that world as well. So that's a little bit about my background. Great. Thanks, Woody. Uh, I'm Chris Knight, uh, director of operations for Montana Specialty Mills. Uh, my background. We'll, we'll skip some of the years because they're not relevant for me right now from owning tattoo shops and whatnot. So um, now we run a oil seed crushing facility. So about a decade ago, a little over a decade ago, I got into the renewable fuels and then that transferred into edible oils. Um, started in conventional oils and moved on now to non-GMO and organic oils flaxseed, flaxseed oils, linseed oils, and whatever else we need to do. Um, the most recent, I moved to Montana to help open up the current facility I'm running there. That is a pretty state-of-the-art, $34 million crushing facility that we built. And again, trying to change the, uh, change the oil industry a little bit from the conventional ways it was done with solvent extraction, conventional oils, and, and riding the healthy side of the oils at this point. So, so that's kind of who I am and, and what I do. All right, so I think we'll, we'll jump into uh, just talking about in general, you know, tech and, and how it comes and plays with food. Um, one of my first kind of introductions to this was learning, you know, different things that, you know, wine producers do and they use different, you know, screening facility or screening projects to verify and look at grapes in a, in a new way of being able to like do with, you know, x-ray technology and, and blowing, just using tech in a thing that historically has been done for, you know, hundreds or thousands of years making wine and then now bringing tech into it. So you kind of see what happens there and one, one of the out, um, kind of like analogies I've used is, you know, back in the day, the best wines were made by people that had the, you know, infrastructure, they had the money to support, you know, going into these big things and, and, and buying the best technology, buying the best equipment. Um, you know, what I see today um, is the, the huge impact uh, minimum wages has affected a lot of our industries and, and watching, you know, the old school way of taking, you know, running a kitchen um, and just saying, oh, this guy's gonna work for eight bucks an hour, who cares if he's on overtime? You know, and that, and that was, that's, that's been the, the, the really interesting thing that I've seen with, you know, what I've done, I've been, I was born in 1980 and I've had a, an interesting career because, you know, I got tech early and then I had to convince baby boomers my whole working life of, hey, I promise this is going to make sense. Let's go this direction. And, you know, it's been, there's been resistance there of, of you know, adopting, oh, the new gadget or gizmo or the scheduling app. And I was like, you know, many hours we sink into screwing around with Excel spreadsheets and getting people to sign off and, oh, I'm going to switch shifts and this, that, and the other. So I think adopting tech, you know, when we talk about ethics there, it's like, it's a, it's a responsibility. And I think that it's, it's anybody in a company, you know, just like you look at sustainability for your company, it's not sustainable to keep doing the old way, you know? So if we're talking about, you know, big ag or, or the beef industry or, or, you know, I love meat, you know, but I'm also interested in helping, you know, plant-based companies move forward because I think that that's a sustainable, you know, way to grow in our food industry. Um, when I was in culinary school, we talked about, uh, you know, oh, don't talk about sous vide. That's not real chefs. Real chefs don't do that. They, they know how to cook. They don't throw things in bags. And then you get to the point where like, no, throwing away 50 pounds of 
or you know, 50 steaks that you didn't need because you got a choice of on a banquet menu, you know, those things make, make a difference. And so when you can use sous vide to be a sustainable and use less meat and use less product, and, and your yields are higher, it makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, when I, when I read over this topic and we were talking about, you know, where are we gonna go with this, I, I think it's just that the ethics are involving tech and in a responsible way, but really doing it and, and committing to it and, and seeing how it fits into your, your ecosystem or your company. Absolutely. Um, in my industry, I mean, obviously tech, tech is huge, especially in the current facility we just finished building. Um, like I was saying, we can crush, process up to 200 tons a day of canola seed and make that into an edible oil. Again, we're really trying to build the organic market. For the oil industry, we're a small business. We, uh, I've, I've worked for companies that are 1,100 tons a day. There's companies out there 3,000 tons a day. But the organic market can't take that right now. So <clears throat> we're focusing on quality, focusing on more natural processing. Um, really getting into the healthy side and, and the technology of that is, is what's key for what we do. I mean, we can, we can look at every point of the process all the way through it. We can make sure that we're reaching temperatures that salmonella can't survive. So, uh, and watch every step of our processing to the point where on any given evening, weekend, anything, I can have two, maybe three people max in the facility, run the whole facility, no problems at all. Um, have a very updated uh, computer system that we monitor every step of the way. What, so if you guys are completely independent, what, where do, who makes the decisions on when you guys do bring in new tech or when you change something or you innovate? Uh, I mean, a lot of that will be stemmed from me and and the contacts I've had through the industry through the last decade and group decisions as to what, what's best for the industry. Um, being as new as we are, it's been helpful because we have, you know, even right now we're looking at inline color spectrums. So as our oil comes through, we can, we can watch the color and we can adjust our dosage as, as minimal as we need to, which, which again plays into the ethical side because the more technology we have in place, the, the more efficient we are, the less emissions we're putting out. I mean, processing is processing no matter what. You, it, it's going to be there. It, it has to happen. And being able to reduce that footprint and, and uh, really just, just save every drop of oil um, is, is key for everything we're doing from a financial standpoint to, to the ethical standpoint on it. Um, what a, I thought this would be more of a fireside chat rather than <laughs> what we're doing here. So does anybody have questions or want to talk about something? Because I'm, I'm open to discussions, but it's a. Uh... I saw somebody with their hand up in the back there. Yeah, yeah so again, I'm the boring uh, machine learning guy, uh, John Leahy, Vice President operations at Laird. So you mentioned that you have, um, you're putting, obviously you're putting more sensor technology all over the place. You can add sensors. It's really cheap now to do that. So my, my question is, and I'm very interested in this, is, have you developed a dynamic system where you're getting immediate feedback loops or are you doing passive identification to know, you obviously want to optimize the conditions to give you the best throughput, right? And so old school technology, even though it may be high tech computer based stuff that you have, says, hey, we'll look at our past records and make adjustments going forward, whereas what I'm trying to address tomorrow is we'll adjust on the fly and let the machines make the decisions for us. Sounds scary, but, but it works. No, uh, absolutely. We, like I said, having live monitoring has is, is really been beneficial. Like you said, it, it has been passive, and we could be processing in, in my previous places of employment, you could be processing, and it's not until you grab some samples, you go and run them, and you find out something's a little out of whack, and not only have you lost that product, but you're making a, you know, what could be an unsafe product as well. So having the live monitoring is, is really beneficial. I'm a big advocate for it. Um, we haven't quite in our process got to the point where, where I'll allow the system to make the changes that need. We still have operators. I like that human interaction between, b 
between the technology and the product. Um, but reducing, reducing the staff, although it still takes quite a bit of staff to, to keep all your equipment running and, and keep the whole plant going as far as even the logistics side, um, it, it reduces the amount of error that's in there. So live monitoring, I think, is great. Uh, the color spectrum I was just talking about that we're looking at putting in our refinery, I want to tie that in to do exactly what you're saying where it will, it will read our clay dosage, which this is a very natural bentonite clay we put in and pull back out and it takes some of the colors away. Um, and it can, it can adjust that on the fly, exactly like you're talking about. So, so as state of the art we are, there's, there's so much technology that's coming out that like you said is, is economical, it's feasible, it's not the millions of dollars it used to be, it's, it's worth it all day long and in the end you save so much money, time, um, employee headaches that, that yeah, I try to put as much in the plan as I can. Our logistics side just in my world is where we're really struggling right now and I'm going to start automating as much of that as I can as far as automated probing systems, um, be able to just type in I want 50,000 pounds of oil in this truck and, and let it start and stop on its own and, and test the quality and give us the samples at the same time. So we still got room to grow, but yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with what you're saying. When you're in a, uh, when you're creating product like that and you're in more of a, I guess, boutique market mm -hmm. in your, in your big picture, what are your challenges with, uh, I guess, sales, like what's, what's your limits to growth? Our limits to growth, um, we really want the, we want Montana Specialty Mills to focus on as much organic as we can. And right now, the organic oil market is, is it's building, it's growing, but we're having a hard time even being able to sell truckloads. I like to sell oil by the truck, by the rail, get it to an end customer, they can package it. We've had stuff in Costco, supermarkets, whatever. Um, but people aren't, aren't purchasing as much of the organic yet. So we're on a smaller scale. We're, we're loading totes, barrels, and getting it to the smaller boutique style customers, which is great, but I, I wanna see that market really start to excel. It's been similar in the wine industry, you know, and, and restaurants too. Like people buy groceries and people buy organic, but they don't necessarily, it's not like they care every restaurant does it. You know what right. I mean? Or they don't, yeah. and they really don't care about wine. A lot of people, you know, I've had certain, you know, it's like there are some people that care about wine, you know, organic grapes or organic, you know, methods and stuff like that. But sure. to get the average consumer to go like make that conscious purchase when they're just at the grocery store buying a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc, it's it's not there. And so yeah. that that's one of the limits that, that stop us from growing that way. Yeah, and that that's kind of stopping everything in a lot of ways. So we see the same thing as far as the FDA has actually been pushing regulations that if you can't detect a genetically modified trait in your final product, you can call it all non-GMO, uh -huh. which is which damages my industry because you can't test for a GMO trait in the final oil. There's no, there's no proteins left, there's no, no traits to test. So that makes everybody out there could call it a non-GMO, which is where, again, kind of go back to technology. We, uh, we are certified by non-GMO project, by QAI, which is organic, um, many other, kosher, um, everything you can think of. And the technology that we use helps us to manage that through our audits, through um, you know, just being able to have full traceability from a computer standpoint or technology standpoint that I can print off, I can show from the the field that this canola was grown in, which we're trying to stay local Montana, you know, everybody right. likes local, so we're doing that as much as we can. But, and we can show the exact field it came from, what truck it was hauled in, into my bins, when it was processed, what oil went out, and our, our technology helps us with that tremendously. Are you measuring trends as, I mean, like... like Absolutely. So is there, I mean, just from looking at data and looking at a graph, like, can you tell that this is going in a certain direction? At a, at a certain point, or do you think your tipping point is? Yeah, we do, um, and and that that's the balancing act. Uh, my process, one of the things that's kept me involved as much as I have, is is it's difficult, okay. 
and, and I like the challenge, and I'm a glutton for punishment. So, so I jump in and I take it all, right? Um, but, but it is, and the incoming seed varies. Every truckload, every field, every batch. So, yeah, we watch all the trends. You, you might see colors start to rise or colors start to drop. Um, flavors, you know, I have our operators, myself included. I like to get out in the field with everybody. And every two hours, we, we pour a little cup of oil and we drink it. Kind of wish I was in the wine industry for that, you know. But we drink oil, so... Um, no, we absolutely watch the trends, and I can print those right off. And but what about trends about the, what the market demand? Oh, market demand trends. Yeah, so that's, that's extremely fluid. Um, it's, we do watch it. We watch it close. Right now, it's a, very, it's a very crazy time in my industry. So the oil industry is just completely blowing up. There's companies in Canada right now talking of building... 3,000 to 7,000 ton a day plants. Um, we're really getting, getting back to what happened about 15, 20 years ago when it became a food versus fuel debate. And the problem with that is we get into the situation where there's, there's just not enough land. So there's, there's crops, everybody needs to eat, renewable fuels are blowing up, there's all sorts of government grants coming out that are helping these industries to be able to, to process fuel, and our oil works for that as well. And it, it, we're starting to get back into that fight where which one's going to win, you know? If you got to have fuel to move everything, is it going to be renewable? Is it going to be biodiesels? Last time, the food industry won. That's why I made the transition from, from fuel to food, and I kind of back up the industry a little more, the product. But... Um, it got to the point where what, what good is all the fuel if, if nobody can eat? Right. And, and yeah, we're, we're right on the verge of that right now. I had a petroleum refinery wanting, to, wanting me to process a million pounds a week, just, just out of control. And we're like, no, that's not what we do here, <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, we watch it, but it, it's, it's volatile. Okay. You know, and, and right now prices are great. I'm, there's not a, we can't make enough oil to keep up, and it, it's going out the door left and right, and, and other companies I know are hitting us up to increase their refineries. So. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Anybody wanna chat about tech? All right, let's go. Hey, uh, <laughs> West Cantrell <laughs> with- stuck uh, on drones with <laughs> Hey, uh, Wes Cantrell with Sunnyside Supply Co. Uh, I just started working at a couple of wineries during the pandemic as kind of a side job. And I was really interested uh, if you could elaborate on, uh, did you mention that you were using machine learning to analyze uh, grapes? Uh, they, they've used it over the years to, to basically, they'll have uh, it come out when they, after they pick and then it goes to the sorter before they send it to the crusher. To get, the, to get grapes that are certain levels, you can pay someone to do it by hand, or they can do um, infrared, and they'll send it through a belt, and then they'll have it blow off the sorting table with like air and stuff like that. So they'll have to be a certain weight that they fall through a wind blade, and they'll be in to so kick all the little hens and chicks, is what they call them, the little tiny, just no good grapes, those get kind of blown out, and, they, and they'll analyze, and they'll see what batch is coming that way. And that's one of the ways that they can maintain a high quality. I'm talking about like some of the top winers, because not everybody can afford this tech. So it's like, you know, and, and I'm sure over the years it gets better. And then you have different bladder presses, you have different, different you know, technology that goes into the, the, the processing of it. And then you have, um, you know, you also have variables of, you know, who you buy from, you know, how, how close everything's planted together, how much, what's your, it's all a yield game as well. So there's a lot of those, those pieces that go through, through that. But again, you're talking about quality level versus making wine for the masses. And, you know, what's value, value subjective. Uh, do you have a particular growing area that you do most of this work in? Uh, I mean, I just, I've lived in, I, I lived in Napa for three years, and, you know, I, I, I've been a, I studied wine for the last 15 years, and so part of that was living in Napa and learning about, you know, that region, what they do. So it's, it's kind of, you get to get hands-on there, but, um, but then every region does a little bit different, every region has different thinking and, you know, what they think about, you know, how, how they're going to do it. You know, some people want to have that old school farmer style, and they're gonna make it very hands off, and, and, and you know, you'll see Sonoma be a little different than Napa in that way, because Sonoma wants to 
have this style of wine. And you know, Napa is a bit more of a, you know, driving Ferraris kind of vibe compared to Sonoma. And, say, and, and, and you look at, there's another thing that happened with wine too, where um, the, uh, you know, look at the trends now, you know, before you have this, you know, expense report, you know, lifestyle of the 80s and 90s and 2000s where people were just, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is blowing up and taking people out to dinner and they're buying big bottles of wine and they want to impress each other. But, you know, millennials and Gen Z do not do that. You know, they're, they just, they're, they like the idea of natural wine because it's hands off. So then you're looking at a product that's volatile because it doesn't, you know, there's, it's not shelf stable and you have these, this totally different, but you're watching the data of like, wow, this stuff is, people are buying this and they're tweeting about it and they're blogging about it and they're, they're this whole entire trend is happening and it's, it's, be, I believe it's like, a, it's the history, it's like the, as it goes on, the organic movement and the food movement and having those discussions and then it ripples over in other industries and people, you know, natural wine is the, you know, the punk rock of wine, you know, it's like, I want to be not the man. And so if you look at that in, in, in beverage and then you get, you know, white claw people, you know, and people that just want to like not think about it too much and just have a drink. So there, there's different layers of it, but I think that uh, the, I like watching food trends and I, it's fascinating for me to hear you guys talk about it at this level of, you know, supply chain and, and, and big stuff because, you know, I've always looked at it from, you know, a chef's standpoint, you know, being in a restaurant and, you know, we, we have conversations about, you know, the ethics of, you know, AI or, or, you know, I've always said, you know, if people, if someone's not cooking your food for you, like that's where, that's unhealthy, you know, and, and it's, it's when you have robots do stuff. And so, and then you look at it, you're like, well, you know, it's also unhealthy to, you know, have people work for these wages that can't make a living. So AI might not be a bad thing to bring in and automate some of the manual labor and these things that it takes to make, pull off this food project and this thing. <laughs> that we do now. Yeah, I, was, I was curious because we're from the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Okay. So a lot of the wineries, it's kind of up and coming, but a lot of the wineries, it's still sort of, uh, still sort of backwoods and rednecky. Um, I worked at uh, one particular winery in Middleburg, Virginia, which is sort of the, uh, if anybody knows the area, it's sort of the, where Congress goes to duck hunt. Um, and those wineries out there, they're definitely at the, the sort of the scale where they definitely could implement more tech. Um, but for the most part, where we're from, it's, it's still very much a uh, sort of a farm operation more than it is a uh, more of a thoughtful, very precise operation. So I was, I was curious about that. A lot of that stuff, I mean, for me, Cruz, and I lived in New York too. And uh, when you're upstate New York, it's like they talk about the wine region. And it's, it's funny, I went to culinary school at the CIA up there. And, and the instructors, I, I was fascinated because we spent all this time talking about these regions of the world. And there's a whole chapter on New York wine. I'm like, this is not a big player in the world. Why are we talking about it so much? But it's because those guys that wrote the book live there. And, 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 uh, and I was like, you guys have been living here too long. But um, the, the funny thing about it is when you're, when you're looking at um, wine and you drive across the country, you know, Temecula is a, you know, between San Diego and here, I guess. And, and that's a region, and they're not, it's not, I'm not gonna say the wines are bad, but the wines are what they are. And, and, and what you do is like, you gotta figure out what your game is. You know, are you making string cheese? Or are you making like aged Gouda? You know, like, what, what are you doing? And are you making cheese that's gonna go into, you know, your five-year-old's lunchbox? Or are you making something that's going on a charcuterie plate that needs to be something different? And a lot of times I look at wine regions that are just randomly across the states. Those are just, it's the best, that's a great bachelorette party. That's a great weekend thing. That's great for tourism. That's great for that economy. It gets people drinking wine. You know what I mean? Like, I like that. It's all good for the industry. And, you know, a lot of people get in the wine industry and they be fancy and they want to talk about, you know, look down their nose at those things. I'm like, no, it's great for what it's there for, you know? And, and, and the cool thing about wine is it's, it is so old school that people can make wine. Like, anybody can make wine. This whole, the whole Valle de Guadalupe region, like, those guys didn't know how to make wine. They still don't know how to make wine, half of them. But what happened was is that there was this guy down there that taught all the growers how to make wine instead of selling them off to the big, the big conglomerates. And so there was like this big wine company, Eli Chetto, that used to buy all the grapes and then none of the farmers knew how to make it wine. They were just, and they taught them. And they all made wine this really weird old school way. And, and you know, it's good for tourism when you can have 50 different places to visit down there and all those things. So, you know, it's, I think it's great for that piece. But again, without the big picture being involved, you know, one of their limits there is there's no, infrastructure so there's not helping there's no water there's nothing you can do with it down there you can't you can't really develop the region in past where it's at already so that, that's an interesting thing about you know when you guys are talking about subsidies and 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 supporting different commerce like that doesn't 
the Vital Guadalupe is never going to do anything else because, you know, a lot of the government down there is run by the tequila and beer companies, so they're not interested in developing the wine, ran, wine, wine groups. Temecula, they're out of grapes. Half the grapes they sell are they're bought from Paso. So they're just pumping these grapes in from Paso, selling them because they have a great, they have a great tourism market there. And so it's like, it's like you look at those, look at wine at that way as like a commodity rather than looking at it as like these are the best wines. And then you, and then you look at a different market. You know, it's like Ferrari is not worried about making the average day car. They, they just make that one style of very uber luxury. And that's what a lot of the wineries in Napa do. And it's fun to go visit there. It's fun to go, you know, if, if it was a little more accessible, a lot of more people would go test drive Ferraris, I'm sure. And that's kind of like going and visiting Napa. It's not like everyone goes up there is buying $500 bottles. So, thank you. All right. Back to drones. Back to drones. <laughs> um, uh, well, while you're talking, one question that popped up to me, you're saying, how are you using like a, I relate it to like a color sorter in our industry, in the ag right. world. Um, what do you do with the, the stuff that's sorted out? Is that the pure waste? Is that? that um, yeah, I, well, at that point, I think they just, they put, throw it to the side because it's just not going to make it into that batch. You know, a lot of the guys, you know. That's even, why I didn't know if you could de degrade it to a Yeah, a people degrade wine, yeah. wine all the time. So, or not degrade, but declassify. Declassify, so they, they go, they declassify, like you might have a region that, or a winery that says, hey, this is, we're going to taste all these, we're going to make these wines, taste them blind, the best ones that we taste, so it's not like picking and choosing, it's like, no, we're not going to say this famous vineyard just gets to be in there because it's there, we're going to say, we're going to actually taste them and say, okay, cool, these are our top three barrels, that's going to be our, our, our best wine, and then the rest of them, we're going to sell off with nobody's going to know our name, and therefore it's, kind of declassified, or they might put in a second project, or it might be, they owe someone a favor and they're gonna sell, you know, grapes. They might sell grapes, they might sell wine, um, but a, or they might not release it. They might just age it and blend it into next year. You know, there, there's a few different things that, that people do, and it's, um, and a lot of it is just to protect the image and the name of what, what you're doing. So, yeah, it could be okay. sold off or bulked out or whatever. The, uh, the, the, the plant that I'm working at right now, we, are trying to reduce our footprint as much as possible. The plant I came from was was uh, designed very well. We actually had had zero waste that went out. We reused almost everything in the plant. Okay. And uh, so a seed comes in, as a real quick, I'll, I'll bore everybody with what our process says in a condensed version. Um, you bring in seed. Uh, we don't do solvent extraction because nobody wants to hear the terms hexane and organic in the same sentence, right? It's a, it's a nasty chemical you don't want to use. Um, so we're expeller pressed only. We do, we just squeeze it, get all the oil out we can, um, do that a couple times, get everything out. That produces a meal. We get to feed the the beef industry, the chicken industry, um, the crude oil. At that point, we clean up any of the solids we get out of that. We squeeze again. We get any remaining oil back out. We then send it to our refinery. It's a three-stage refinery we run through degumming, bleaching, deodorization, scary terms, and, and people, there's all sorts of debates you can talk about in the canola industry. We won't get into that here, but um, it, it's a very mild process. It, it's really mild. It, you're pulling out solid, you're pulling out some tocopherols, some, some carotenes, you're pulling out all the stuff that's healthy for you and right. selling the oil that you need. Okay. <laughs> um, but with that, you get a small amount of byproduct. But almost every single byproduct that comes out of our process goes back into the meal. So, so we have almost no waste. And, and that's what I'm striving for in the company we're with now. Right now, I do have a little bit of wastewater that I treat and make sure it's safe and send it to the city. But, but again, that's where technology and ethics yeah, it's, weigh, weigh in with each other heavily. It's right? interesting because I, I did some time in the cannabis industry too, and we talked mm -hmm. about um, you know extractions and, and, yep. and oils there, and, and it's, you get into it and you're like you know oh cannabis da da da, and then everyone starts ta you start learning oh they're using solvent extractions and all kinds of stuff, and and you you realize like oh it's not as just the plant that everyone's talking about. It's, no, there's it's a lot not. of there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, and then you go to a conference like this. I went to a few of them, and they're like, "Oh, this is a rosin press, and all we're doing is like a heat press, and it's just like to get the you know, pull the oils out, and then that's you know considered this quality level." And then you and then you see, well, that's so expensive, and everyone you know it's it's weird to see what the market gets into because you go to the you know cannabis shop or the dispensary, and you're seeing, okay, you know these products cost fifty bucks, but I can get this pin for ten dollars. Yeah, because it's 
full of chemicals and it's no. not, it's, you should not be smoking that. Like, and so it's, it's interesting to hear you guys, you talk about the, the extraction process and mm -hmm. being more of a, I guess. And I actually, for a little while, got hired into the cannabis, 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 cannabis industry as well, um, just because of that, because they're trying to model it after what we do. Right. And, and that, that's the problem with it. You hit it right on the head is that it's not being regulated. It's it's not being watched, and then yeah, it's pure solvent extraction. And well, that yeah, and, then, and the other same thing on the other side, the provenance or like where this came from. That's a in the mm -hmm. in the wine industry, we've regulated all of that. It was like we we went through and said, hey, this is truth and labeling laws. This is what this means. I saw cannabis products coming out and it had the word organic across it, huge letters, and it was like made with organic fertilizer, real small. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, can that even be legal? There's no way you can write that on a thing because. You know, the wine industry, you know, you write made with organic grapes, which, okay, cool, but, you know, it's not an organic wine unless you follow the whole organic yeah. process. But um, the, the cannabis side where it was talking about, you know, use those truth and labeling laws, and I think that that's an interesting piece of cannabis is that as it came in, you know, there's a big fight right in Northern California right now is unregulated. If they're unregulated and they're not following labor laws and they're not allowed to, you know, go to the same, be held to the same, uh, I guess, thing as everyone else, yeah, you know, same, same, standards. Same, same standards as everyone yep. else, then, then it's, a, it's, a, it's a disruptor that's not, I guess, a, it's, an, it's a hard piece to like, regu not re regulate, yeah, but a hard piece to integrate into kind of where we are now in the, in the labor force. Um, yeah. It is. Yeah. Where are we at, time-wise? <laughs> no clue. All right. Any other questions out there? Hi, um, what do you do with packaging waste? Or is that not part, I know you, you say you have zero waste, mm -hmm. but what about packaging waste? Packaging waste? Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately right now there's, there's a little more packaging waste out of the facility I'm currently involved with. Uh, where I came from and what I want to get us to at Montana Specialty Mills is, is reducing that as much as I can, which is bringing everything in bulk. We do our own storage. We load out in bulk, so we reuse the same same shipping containers. You know, be it a, a truck or rail car most of the time. And I would bring in what little bit of processing age we have um, in bulk as well. So that that's probably funny that you should say that. That's probably the biggest area of waste that I have in my plant right now that that I'm going to be addressing here in probably the next three four years. We're getting ready to do another big upgrade to the facility, so we're going to get through that, which is going to increase our efficiency, reduce our footprint, reduce our waste, and then, yeah, I want to get as much bulk product as possible, and that pretty much takes that out of there at that point, at least for, for our facility, you know. How do you measure that? How do you measure your reduction of waste? Um, it kind of depends in, in which way. I mean, w everything has, you, we're going to get back into technology here. I'm kind of a technology geek. Um, we have flow meters for everything. We have weight cells. We uh, just, I mean, like I said, we have eyes on just about everything that we do and, and measure that, and we meet about it daily. I, I track it on all the Excel spreadsheets that we live and right. that have to live by that, uh, and, and if anything starts trending the wrong direction, I mean, we have to address it immediately and find out what went south, what happened, what, what we're doing there. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing battle with my management team. Yeah, thank you. Anything else from? From us up here. He really wants to get into drones. So. <laughs> I just like the, I like uh, the subject that they brought. I actually have a, a question about uh, oil pressing because uh, we're actually the startup that I'm representing. We actually are, uh, uh, much like Jonathan was promoting, uh, was we actually got into it uh, for hemp uh, to process hemp seeds. Um, and we got really lucky in meeting local farmers that utilize no spray, no till technique. And uh, you're talking about trying to transition to organic oils. And I'm curious, have you tried to address uh, transitioning to no-till um, as an alternative to organic? As, 
I guess I, I missed a small part of that. Re restate that for me. Are, are so, we interested in processing hemp seeds themselves or just? No, no, no. I was just giving context uh, because we have our own oil pressing uh, facility. Uh -huh. uh, but my question is more of, uh, do you work with any no-till farmers and have you looked into what it would take to actually uh, transition away from conventional tillage into no-till? With, with the farmers themselves to transition them into growing more organic? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I have a, I have a very good marketing team merchandising team at our facility that that's that's their main job is contracting our farmers we we contract our farmers individually for their seed um, we really have to balance it out with what the market will will allow so it's more non-gmo than it is organic right now and we don't get into the conventional at all I, we don't want anything to do with it our plants too small to survive that um, so as our as our sales side and our sales team and the, and the market itself keeps growing, and if it grows more towards organic, which is really what we want to do, then we contract the farmers to start growing more organic, and they get a better premium for that, a little yes, less yield, because you know we tell them you can't just hose it down with Roundup and Liberty Link and, and all that fun stuff. But, but no, we, uh, it, it really, unfortunately, is dictated by the market. So the more the market can, can build up and, and excel in the healthier directions, then the more we can cater to that and, and we do that from the, from the ground level, for straight from the farm. Okay. Uh, and the farmers that you work, are they all in Montana? The majority are. So where I'm located is in Great Falls, Montana. That's known as the Golden Triangle. It's a it's big agricultural area. Um, as, as much as we possibly can, we, we grow as local as possible. Okay. Um, if we need to, we reach outside there a little bit, have a, some seed that's come from Canada. Um, Midwest is a big grower. So we've had to until we can get more growers on board. But for the most part, we've been pretty self-sustained out of, out of just Montana. Okay. And another follow-up question, do the farmers that you work with, uh, do they pay good attention to their soil health? They do, so, and especially the organic. The non-GMO project isn't quite as strict as the, the QAIs and the other organic certifications that are out there. Um, with, the, with the organics, the farmers themselves and their land and, and everything involved with them has to go through a pretty strict organic regimen to to be able to call it an organic product. Um, Non-GMO has a little more leeway, so they're not doing the in-depth soil analysis and what was the last five, ten years of crops, whatever it is they have to go through to verify the soil is just as, as organic as they can be. But um, yeah, if, like I said, we, we're really under a lot of scrutiny on the organic side. Non-GMO has been around quite a bit longer in my industry in the oil seeds, so there, there's a little more freeness that happens there that another reason I'd like to stick towards organic. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Woody. What do you think about now with all the hospitality thing that things have started to open up with the cakes, like the package for the wines, like the big barrels for bars and restaurants. I can't make out exactly. Can you speak a little louder? Ah, s sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, what do you think now that things are starting to open mm -hmm. uh, with the cakes, with the packages of the wines? The big barrels for the on-premise accounts. When we're opening packages of big barrels on-premise is what I made out there. Yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with the cakes. The um, it's like a wine barrel. Like a, yeah, like a keg, like a wine barrel. Mm -hmm. And you're asking about what's your opinion? Because I see that it's, it's like a trend right now. Having like full barrels at at a winer at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. or? Yeah. I haven't seen like a barrel. I've seen, I mean, I've seen like kegs, like like. Oh, are you talking about just just keg wines? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. no. Keg wines are great. Um, you know, the, the the difference between keg wines is you're not going to have the same 
development. So if you make a wine to be produced, like if you're making, you know, something that's not something super special and extravagant, like you're, you know, you're making a very fancy car, you're going to put leather seats in it, da, 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 da. That's, that's not a keg wine. Keg wine is going to be something that's going to be $9, $10 by the glass, maybe 10, 12 bucks by the glass, something that hey, it's great for bartenders because you're not, it's great for, for eco too. You're not blowing through block bottles for no reason. You're not throwing corks, you know, opening corks every, you know, five glasses. You're, it, it's, a, it's a great piece for the right, for the right application. Um, you know, some, I, I have a friend that has a restaurant. He's like, listen, we're mostly a cocktail bar. We have wine as an amenity, basically. Um, he's like, and the kegs are great because the customer experience of it is it's an anaerobic, you know, there's no just oxygen sitting there and, and messing it up that way. Um, and, it, and you can get a consistent product out of it. Is it, sometimes those things aren't that interesting. You know, we, we, I worked at, you know, I worked at Michelin Star Restaurant up in San Francisco and we had keg wine. Um, but it was our Vinda Craft program. It was it was designed to be like craft wines, just like something simple. Like if you're you know sitting in you know wine country and they you're just drinking with you know hey the, the, and that's the cool thing about that restaurant is we had we bottled it that way by having it be some random project that was by this famous winemaker that he made a little something extra for this local restaurant and we we bulked it as mass California wine and we just had different people putting it stuff into batches, but it was not a uh, it was not a boutique product. So that, that's the thing is like, is like it, it can work really well. And the wine industry does really well if you buy wines that are made like that. Um, but if you're trying to, you know, when you're making wines that are not, you know, if you're trying to hold that against something that has a lot of love and care and, and, and technical, you know, strength, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that's a great wine. So that, it's very subjective going back and forth. But I think that those are, those are um, if you have the right, also the consumption patterns. You don't, you don't want a keg gonna sit there for two years either. So if, you, if you're if you buying the right production, you're moving the product, it, it can work really well. Thank you. Yeah. So is it kind of based on price and quality that you don't see your higher end wines keg? You, it just, it's, it's more of a, a lot of people in the wine industry have ego. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't want to see their wines keg. So that, that's kind of the funny part is like you, you have these guys that like, you know, a lot of people in the wine industry start off, you know, as like, you know, millionaires or CEOs of other companies and now they want somewhere where they can go open a company and have a write off account to, sure. you know, hey, I'm doing market research. I'm drink, eating caviar and <laughs> drinking champagne. <laughs> so you have these things and then like, no, I don't want my wine to be that or of course I want my wine to be tons of oak and have all this, you know, and have, I want the bottle to weigh 40 pounds and like, that, that, there's a lot of that goes into it. So when you find someone that is like, you know, there, there's a, there were some wines that we had um, that were, I mean, they're just made for hanging out with friends. You know, like sure. th those kind of wines, like when you have a winemaker make those and they're making keg wine for that reason, awesome. You know, if you're making wines like, hey, we brought all these from Argentina and these are, you know, or, or the, the, you find wines that are made for that type of interaction with people rather than trying to be like some uh, ceremony, like opening a bottle for somebody and making it special that way. So it's, it's, same thing, you know, whiskeys and stuff. You know, if, yeah. you, if you're just drinking, you know, makers, like that's nothing wrong with makers. You know what I mean? Like I like makers. If you want to get real precious about it, you can drink fancier stuff, but <laughs> nothing wrong with that. So it's ego and presence? It can, it can, <laughs> yeah, it ha happens. I saw one person over here, I think, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I'm developing a project where um, the, the farm, that comes straight from the farm into our facility, uh, much like a, a gourmet vintage market. And there are also other uh, chefs and uh, pastry chefs and bakers that will be there. My goal is to make it as self-sustaining as possible. Um, and listening to more and more about what I've been hearing this morning, not to, I guess, necessarily put a finite timeline, but what does something like that take? Is that a six-month, a year, a two-year to become self-sufficient and self-sustaining uh, where you don't have the waste? I think that's a that's a pretty varied question. Um, it's, it's how much time and energy you want to put into it. We I have to kind of triage and priority prioritize everything we're doing, and waste is, is pretty high up on my on my radar as what we need to get done. But at the same time, I have to build a business that's that's functional, self sufficient, and and profitable, and. So that's, that's kind of how I end up balancing that out. I don't know if that's the, the, 
best way to go about it or not, but, but how I kind of look at things is, is has, as we continue to build the business, I'll, I'll keep using organic as, as something to talk about. Um, and the more and more money that comes in, and then it's, it comes down to return on investment for me and, uh, and what that means. And, and waste is, is waste all the way around. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for the pocketbooks. It's, it's bad for the performas. It's bad for everything we do. So it's high on there, but yeah, it's, it all pencils one way or the other. And, and it's the return on investment that we end up looking at bottom line. So, you know, could that be six months? Possibly. Um, I'm probably in a process of two to three years before I can get everything to the point I want for our facility. So it's, I don't know, it varies a lot for me. I think I was on a sustainability panel at the National Restaurant Show last year, or two years ago right now. But they, um, you know, one of the things we talked about, I, I said, you know, it reminded me of something I learned in the Navy, which was when, you learn, when you're in the Navy, everyone becomes a firefighter because you're out to sea, you all need to learn how to fight fires. And one of the main things they taught was like, you know, it's not the fire extinguisher or the halon or the, you know, the fire suppression system or the water hose or the, you know, the oxygen display. It's the system. It's the whole, the uninhibited chain reaction of the fire tetrahedron. So it's like you got to have, you, it's not just having a fire extinguisher. It's having the training. It's having the certification. It's having the permitting. It's all those things together. And so when we had this conversation about sustainability and, and looking after, it was like, well, it'll happen or it'll be part of it if you make it part of it. So, you know, we, we, I was like, the biggest thing you can do as a CEO is probably peg someone in your company and give them that title. You know what I mean? And they make sure that, that is, they're on the board of, of conversations. And that was something that we, and same with, you know, the, the diversity conversation we've had in the last, you know, this last year. It's like, you know, having that person have a seat at the table so we make decisions like that holistically as a team. And it's not, and it's about creating, you know, the last subject we had up here, the guy was like, you got to create a whole system around it. You can't just have one guy or one, one meeting about it a month. It's like, no, that should be part of the guiding principles of a company. And, and so if you're, you're creating a system of sustainability, have somebody there. If you're creating you know, you, a diverse company, have somebody, and have them at the board meetings, have them at the decision-making meetings, because when you have those considerations and someone has a voice at the table, um, I think that those, those speed things along. Um, I worked at this restaurant in New York, and it was, uh, I mean, we did things that were fascinating to me. We had you know, all of our compost after, you know, we ran this Michelin restaurant, we, all the compost, it was on a farm, we would take out and it would go into a compost pile, but then they had a glycol system running through the compost pile, and then that glycol system ran underneath the greenhouses to heat in the winter so we could grow vegetables year round. And it was all off of this passive energy you know, re reclamation that went back over to here. And I mean, those are because every week when they have a conversation about the farm, that's that per somebody's there talking about that. And it was like, I was like, all right, wow. And they had beekeeper people from you know Africa studying beekeeping. They had people from Cornell growing tomatoes that were perfect golf balls like you know, all these different like groups going on but everything they decided on that farm was about food and sustainability and and those pieces so I think that you know like from what I've seen you know and then I've seen you know I've seen when we opened the Grand Omar I opened that hotel in San Diego big fancy resort real great but like we had the the first position I one of the first people I met is like oh I'm the lead certified you know green protector guy of the property and I, I'm just here to make sure that every and he goes to every meeting and every board meeting and they have all those conversations so I saw that get implemented and I was like I think that that's a, a, a pretty cool way to to make sure that you're you're keeping up to speed there and you're not getting behind in those departments because it's really easy to just have financial meetings <laughs> it is no the the key, and one of the things that's happened with the company I'm in is we, we have a fairly new president that got on board with us. He, he's been phenomenal, and he's, he spends the first year of anything he does putting the right team in place, and that's having the right individuals, and, and doesn't mean there's no fights, and we all butt heads because we're very passionate about what, what we do, but, but yeah, getting the right team in place, I think it's key to that. All right. Anyone else? How are we in time? Yeah. We didn't All get right. to your drones. I'm sorry, Woody. No drones today. <laughs> yeah, it's part two. So, anybody know anything about drones? I want to, uh, any drone conversation about this? No. All right. No drones. All right. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you.